But MI5's files have revealed a more serious case of potential treachery, this time by a major trade union figure. Former KGB officer Alek Gordievsky, who secretly worked for British intelligence, found his case file. In the British section of the KGB, I looked through the files of the so-called agents. Some agents were very weak, doing very little for the KGB, but still it was a kind of assets, and we were supposed to run them as agents as much as possible. And there was a file of Jack Jones. Jack Jones was a veteran of the International Brigade in the Spanish Civil War. He went on to become leader of the Transport and General Workers Union. Hugely popular and widely respected, he died in spring 2009, aged 96, having become a much-loved champion of old-age pensioners in his retirement. The allegations that Jack Jones was a KGB agent shocked his surviving family. His youngest son, Michael, is currently clearing his father's South London flat. The cry, and it's been made recently, every man for himself. Representatives of work people I want to see. This um, meeting is yes. to demonstrate the trade union unity with the pension. Mr. Andrew must have realised that when you reveal what's in MI5 files like this, with no real proof, that the nastiest sections of the gutter press in this country are bound to seize on uh, these kind of canards and blow them up. And, and, you know, it's very distressing. Obviously not just for me, but for many members of the family and, and very good friends of Jack, of which he had very many, of course, in this country, because, you know, he really did work all his life to try to improve the conditions for ordinary working people. The book says that from 1964 to 1968, the KGB regarded Jack Jones as an agent. KGB judgment, not MI5 judgment. Why did the KGB reach that conclusion? Because during that period of four years, Jack Jones was willing to provide confidential but not secret and certainly not classified Labour Party and trade union material to a contact in the Soviet embassy. Uh, for which the KGB was ever so grateful. According to the files, when Czechoslovakia's Prague Spring of 1968 was crushed, Jones turned his back on the KGB. In 1982, Alek Gordievsky was posted to London. There was a telegram. Please resume the contacts with our old agent, Jack Jones. So very unwillingly, I visited him in his flat and invited him to a restaurant. And then I asked the head of station, should I give him money? And he, knowing a little bit of Jack Jones's background, he said, yes, give him some cash. What is claimed is that Gordievsky slipped him 250 pounds. <laughs> it's ridiculous why my father would never take money for anything like that. I mean, he twice turned down the offer of being in a House of Lords. He was offered endless directorships of companies. He could have feathered his nest over and over. We could have been living in a mansion house. I showed him the list of the three union leaders and asked him to describe each of them, who of them can be recruitable for the KGB. And he wrote on this list who was recruitable for the KGB. He was absolutely proper and very, very valuable agent for the KGB, distinguished agent of the KGB. He was very respected by the KGB and very, um, um, uh, very much um, loved by the department because he was a dream of the KGB, so brilliant and so useful and so well disciplined. These are just reports from a notorious double agent. I don't know why I should believe anything he says, really. I mean, he was obviously a professional liar. Gordievsky may yet drop another bombshell. He claims that there is at least one other important political figure from that era whose Soviet contacts are suspicious. The security service has got reasons to keep some names still secret. So Christopher Andrews' book is 1,000 pages, but it's not the whole truth. It is probably only three quarters of the truth. Until the late 1960s, MI5's resources had been devoted to counter-espionage defending the nation from spies at home, abroad, even within. 
But then, a new threat emerged. The provisional IRA began a campaign of shootings and bombings across the United Kingdom, repeatedly striking at the heart of the British establishment. The lead intelligence role in Britain was run not by the service, but by the Metropolitan Police. But MI5 did have the lead role in Gibraltar. So the biggest ever deployment till that point of MI5 against the IRA takes place not in the United Kingdom, but in Gibraltar. In February 1988, an MI5 surveillance team was working with Spanish police on Operation Flavius. The events which followed became an international controversy. The flames were fanned by a TV documentary, Death on the Rock. MI5 was caught up in allegations of a shoot-to-kill policy. The files show that Siobhan O'Hanlon, a known provisional IRA explosives expert, was spotted crossing the Spanish border into Gibraltar. An MI5 surveillance map survives of her precise route. It shows her going into the Gibraltar Cathedral to light a candle, say a prayer. She believed in the justice of her cause. O'Hanlon was on her own surveillance mission. The IRA's target was the Royal Gibraltar Regiment's changing of the guard ceremony. MI5's files show that O'Hanlon watched the ceremony, then, excitedly, phoned Danny McCann, a known IRA hitman. Then, she headed back across the border. But when she's back in Spain, she spots Spanish surveillance, so she goes back to Ireland, and that saves her life. According to the files, Siobhan was replaced by Mairead Farrell. MI5's role was to coordinate intelligence, plan a response to the IRA team, and guide and advise the police as the operation unfolded. Events reached a climax on Sunday, March the 6th, 1988. At 2.25 that afternoon, Farrell and McCann were observed crossing La Linea checkpoint on foot by an MI5 surveillance team. A third terrorist, Sean Savage, drove across the border unnoticed. Later, the three met in a park. At around 3.40, an SAS team intercepted and shot all three dead. Did the soldiers give a warning? They didn't give them the, 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 the option of, of surrendering or, or, or defending themselves. They just killed them, and I, I think that was not, that was not a good thing. I, I don't think it was right and proper. The MI5 files paint a picture of the SAS team facing a classic dilemma. They said they couldn't risk the parked car being a car bomb or the IRA team drawing weapons. But it turned out that the IRA team was unarmed and there was no bomb in their car. What you have to say is, there were plenty of opportunities to arrest those IRA members before they got into Gibraltar. And since they were unarmed, could they have been taken without shooting? Perhaps. And the final thing you've got to ask is, do you employ the SAS if you want people to be taken alive? I'm entirely satisfied from looking at the files that this was not shoot to kill. If there had been any deliberate intention to shoot to kill, then press lines would have been uh, prepared to explain why it was that they had been killed. One of the reasons for the confusion afterwards is that there was absolutely no government line on why these three people had been shot, which is why ministers contradict themselves uh, the following day. If there had been a deliberate policy, the story would have been worked out in advance. I think that one of the problems that Christopher